Hey everyone, we have another very long episode today. 1990's been kind of a taxing year so far, with Dragon Quest IV, Power Blazer, Crystallis, Ninja Gaiden 2, and now Final Fantasy III. However, things are going to chill out a little bit after this, which is a good thing, since Final Fantasy III nearly killed me. We also have some total garbage from Bandai, and another Imagineering game. Also, the first entry in a long-running tactical RPG series. Alright, let's get started. Hey, let's start off with the most boring game this episode, Kurogani Hiroshi no Yosu Daisuki. And this is the second horse racing game of 1990, and just like the first one, it uses the name and likeness of a real-life individual. In this case, Hiroshi Kurogane. That's him depicted on the title screen. Now, if you remember the Isaki Shuguru game from what, three episodes back? you recall there were tons of menus and options to go through to take out loans and place bets and all that kind of thing. However, this game is almost all menus. Like, so many menus. This looks way more complicated than the last game. Hiroshi Kurogani is actually a manga artist, and not one that probably many people outside of Japan will be familiar with. He seems like a reasonably well-respected artist who works in a humorous style, sometimes in historical settings. So his stuff is pretty different from the horny teenagers and sci-fi or fantasy settings that are popular among Western manga fans. He was apparently a good friend of Koichi Sugiyama, and was also a gambling addict, which explains the horse racing connection. Apparently, he put down a lot of money on horse racing. So, as I mentioned earlier, lots of menus. I was watching a playthrough of this, and the guy literally spent 20 minutes in the menus before the first horse race started. So you gotta do a lot of optimization on your horses or whatever. I mean, look at this, geez, I gotta name all these horses? Anyway, once you've gotten your horse stats all fixed or whatever, you can actually start racing. And here's the funny thing, just like the last horse racing game, it's not exactly visually striking, it's functional, and it does also play the William Tell Overture during the race. I'm kind of curious now if every Japanese horse racing game uses this piece of music. I suppose we'll find out eventually. Also released on April 20th, we have Fire Emblem, the first game in a beloved tactical JRPG series. Well, it, it's a beloved series now. Back in 1990, this game was not considered to be that hot. The Fire Emblem series was definitely a grower, not a shower. Over the years, it gained a strong following not only in Japan, but surprisingly in the US. This, of course, was never released for the NES in the US, 
but there is a pretty slick translation patch, so we're going to check that version out. The opening intro goes through the various classes and such that are available in the game, and these are very much rooted in traditional Western fantasy. You have paladins, various types of knights, multiple kinds of archers, priests, clerics, the whole nine yards. The look and feel of this game is very much a medieval Western fantasy setting. So we have some brief expository dialogue between the two main characters, Marth, sometimes translated as Mars, and Sheeta, a princess whose castle is being attacked by pirates as the game opens. A few dialogue boxes later, the action begins. You need to defeat the enemy forces and take back the castle. So, as you can see, we're on a little island here. The castle is on the western side of the island and is surrounded by pirates. There are around 14 enemies, and your own forces are only 7 in number. But of course, you will triumph because you are smarter than a computer. Hopefully. Now this is completely turn-based. You move your guys around, and when you've completed your turn, the enemy then does their turn. Sheeta here is equipped with a flying horse and can travel pretty far each turn, and can move over otherwise impassable terrain. Once you engage an enemy, we go to the combat screen, which is completely automated. You and the enemy each get a turn, though the attacking player often gets to attack twice, depending on the weapon, I think, and as well as their agility stat. Once you're done moving your characters, you can end the turn, and then the enemy has their turn. Aside from fighting, you can do other things, like visit the houses that are scattered around the land and get some hints. Fire Emblem was developed by Intelligent Systems, who worked on a number of NES games, including Metroid. Though Intelligent Systems is technically a separate company from Nintendo, but that has close connections to Nintendo R&D 1. The game was produced by Gunpei Yokoi and designed by Shozu Kaga. Intelligent Systems also produced Advanced Wars, an earlier military tactics game which we covered back in Crontendo 34. Oh yeah, and this dude, he just gives you 10,000 gold. That seems like a lot of money, but you'll notice that the enemies don't drop money when you kill them, just experience points. Now, what do you need money for? Well, mostly weapons. You see, years before Breath of the Wild and Dark Souls, Fire Emblem had breakable weapons. Specifically weapons that have a limited number of times they can be used. And you can actually see how many uses are left, you know, just by looking at the weapon stats. This first level is pretty simple. The enemies won't charge at you all at once, so you can take them on in small groups. One thing that bugs me, these guys are supposed to be pirates, but on the world map, they look sort of like Iron Man for some reason. The pirate boss will remain within the castle walls for protection. Once you defeat him, you have beaten the level. Gazak, as he's called, is reasonably tough, but can be taken down just by throwing your guys at him one at a time. Now, as soon as you enter the castle, the king gives you a little speech, and you can save your game. Like many strategy or tactics games, this is divided into smaller episodes or scenarios or whatever. Some levels will give you new characters, like Aguma here. 
There's a total of 25 levels, with the last one involving the huge castle that you have to fight your way through. I looked up a complete playthrough of this and it was about 22 hours long, so it's a pretty damn long game. Now you do get a few totally badass dudes in your party in this level. Doga is a tankish character in heavy armor who can just wreck some dudes. Characters can also carry more than one weapon, though they can only attack with one weapon during a battle. You can switch weapons at the beginning of your turn. And in the box near the bottom of the screen, you have these bars indicating how your stats compare to your opponents. And also, when you're not fighting, you can move the cursor around the map and check out enemy stats. Now, the type of terrain that you're standing on also impacts your stats, giving you bonuses. So standing in the forest gives you a 15% defense bonus. The game very helpfully shows you a box displaying this information on the screen for about half a second at the beginning of each battle. Also in some levels you can recruit certain characters. These guys will all have names, unlike the generic bad guys and a certain character will need to talk to them in order to get them to switch sides. Unfortunately, this dude died immediately after I recruited him when attacked by multiple pirates. And here's the thing about Fire Emblem. You can't just throw a phoenix down or cast a revive spell or something on this guy. He's almost permanently dead. Technically, there is an item much later in the game that can revive someone, but doing so would be pretty much pointless because he wouldn't have been earning experience for most of the game, and he would then be too underpowered to really be of much use. Permanent death is one of the hallmarks of the Fire Emblem series, though if an important character like Marth dies, you get a game over and then you have to reload from your last save state. As I mentioned earlier, another absolutely wacko thing that Fire Emblem does is making your weapons wear out over time. So you'll need to buy weapons from an armory, which appears on certain levels. And unfortunately here, all we're being offered is just generic lame weapons. And also in the style of the Dragon Quest IV inventory, a character can only hold a certain number of weapons, and the character that bought the weapons has to walk up to the character you want to give the weapon to in order to actually make the transfer. Like, you literally need to have both characters in adjacent squares. And while this is, I guess, realistic, it's also a pain in the ass. Here's another dude that you can recruit if Sheeta talks to him, though he looks like an absolute wiener. Fire Emblem was not very well received upon its initial release, with Famitsu giving it a mere 26 out of 40. Initially, sales were sluggish, but over time it improved, resulting in a sequel being released for the Famicom in 1992. Since then, the Fire Emblem series has slowly risen through the ranks to become actually a reasonably successful RPG series. Fire Emblem was among the very first NES games to get remade for the Super Famicom, with Intelligent Systems starting work on a 16-bit version in 1992. Released in January 1994, Fire Emblem, Mystery of the Emblem, is a two-part game. The first part is simply a remake of the original, and the second half is a sequel of sorts. The game is reasonably faithful to the original, but with more colors, higher resolution graphics, and some minor gameplay changes, such as showing the range that your character can move on the map. It also introduced the support system, in which nearby friendly characters can influence a battle. The will of Henri the Great has fallen at the now the weird thing is, there was an anime spin-off of this game, which was released in the United States. And death 
rule half the world. The Fire Emblem cartoon was the first official Fire Emblem product to make its way over here. This was followed in 1996 by the oddball Genealogy of a Holy War, which wasn't even originally conceived as a Fire Emblem game. It's technically a prequel, taking place like a thousand years before the first game. And this was the first game to introduce the skills mechanic, which are special abilities that characters could learn, almost kind of like magic. It also introduced the series Rock, Paper, Scissors hierarchy of weapons. This game was actually very popular, becoming the best-selling Fire Emblem game at that time. The sequel, Fire Emblem Thracia? Thracia? 776 was not so lucky selling only around 100,000 copies, probably due to being released very late into the Super Famicom's lifespan. This thing hit the shelves in January 2000, or four years after Super Mario 64 and three years after Final Fantasy VII. That said, today it is a fan favorite and was critically well received at the time. Famitsu gave it a 35 out of 40. The series then moved on to handheld devices, starting with the Binding Blade in 2002, which had begun life as a Nintendo 64 title. It was followed by a prequel, the Blazing Blade in 2003, which incredibly received a US release, the first Fire Emblem game available outside of Japan. The US release was clearly due to the success of Advance Wars for the Game Boy Advance, which was also developed by Intelligent Systems. Despite being released one day before the World Trade Center attack, Advance Wars was a critical and popular hit in the US. Now by this time, the Fire Emblem series offered a pretty smooth experience with tutorials, fancy battle animations, the whole nine yards. After a GameCube and a Wii game, Fire Emblem settled into a comfortable groove with a series of DS titles. First up was Shadow Dragon, the second remake of the original game, done in a style resembling the Game Boy Advance games. Unlike the original, Shadow Dragon kind of eases you in slowly with a long opening tutorial level and lots of dialogue explaining what's going on. A very different experience from the original game. After this, there were DS remakes of Fire Emblem Gaiden and the second part of The Mystery of Emblem. By 2012, the series was facing declining sales and Nintendo was on the verge of canceling the series entirely. However, the next game, Awakening, ended up being a substantial hit, selling over 2 million copies, and lifted the series out of its cult status and into the mainstream, with gallons of jizz being spilled by Western game critics. It had fancy anime graphics, 3D models, the game threw in mechanics from many past games, and counting uh, DLC and all that kind of stuff, it had something what? like 150 playable characters. 2015's Fates was an even bigger critical and popular hit, selling over 3 million copies, a proverbial 20 year overnight success. It was followed by Three Houses for the Switch in 2019. At the moment, the entire series is relatively accessible to English-speaking fans, with virtually all of the Japanese games having received fan translations. The original NES version of Fire Emblem did eventually get an official English release in 2020 for the Switch of all things. 
It was added to the eShop in December 2020 and then removed in March 2021. However, it was also released as an expensive deluxe physical version, which contains a fake NES cartridge and that sort of thing. You can still find copies of this if you don't mind paying around $100 or so. Okay, so going back to the game, here's the next boss. He can be kind of a tough dude. You do have archers who can attack him from a distance, though this guy is actually capable of doing the same to your archers. Gordon here got a lucky shot in, a critical hit. Sometimes enemies will drop weapons as well. Generally speaking, most levels have you being attacked from multiple sides, so you often have to take care of the nearest group of enemies quickly so you don't get overwhelmed by fighting two groups at once. The game does give you healers, which can be used to heal wounded units. There's also these little fortresses that will gradually heal you if you place your unit inside of them, but of course it can only hold one unit at a time. Also, certain classes can promote, that is, they can upgrade to a new class, though promotion is somewhat limited in this game compared to later games in the series. Okay, here's another little bit where Sheeta can recruit someone. Whoa, ho, ho! You can do anything you want to me. Hmm, Sheeta is a very kinky girl, it sounds like. Eventually, you'll have so many characters that you'll need to choose which one you actually want to use in a particular level. One thing about Fire Emblem is that you can't really brute force your way through it. You pretty much have to think tactically. Placement of your characters is very important. One unit can only occupy a space at a time. There's no stacking of units, like there are in many computer strategy games. And you do want to kind of range your units so that individual units can't be attacked by multiple enemies. Now, I didn't get too far into the game because, quite frankly, I am not normally very good at these kind of tactical games. I'm not really a tactical thinker. I tend to play impulsively in video games, and this will just get you killed in Fire Emblem. Unlike Civilization or something, where you can just create more units if you get massacred. And while this is probably not anyone's favorite tactical RPG, Fire Emblem's eventual success inspired the likes of Final Fantasy Tactics and Tactics Ogre. If you're curious about the series, you might be better served by starting off with one of the Super Famicom or DS games. Alright, let's take a look at some Western releases for April, or US only games, as I erroneously sometimes call them. Many of these did in fact get released in Europe. It wasn't all Specky and Mega Drive over there. Ooh, and hey, we got a sexy lady robot here. Sure would like to bone that robot. Pinbot is a pinball video game. But unlike most pinball video games we've seen in Crontendo, it's based on a specific real-life pinball table. Hence the credits for Williams on the title screen. One strange thing, while Pinbot was released in 1990, and the back of the box has a 1990 copyright date, the title screen shows a 1988 copyright to Rare, which makes me wonder if the release for this got postponed for some reason. So, the layout of the table on the screen is a little strange. 
The table is too long to fit vertically, thus the camera will pan upwards when the ball is in the upper part of the table. But you presumably will not want to lose sight of your flippers while playing this, so the screen is actually sliced in two and only the upper portion pans up. The lower section of the table is always visible. This is a pretty unusual solution that I don't think we've seen before, and it's made more visually legible by the fact that Rare drew the table in perspective, so you can easily see where the split is. As I mentioned, this is based on a real table. In fact, a very well-known Williams pinball table from 1986, which was really ambitious for its time. It has a number of speech samples and something of a plot. Your object was to travel from planet to planet. The visor thing can be activated and will open up when you activate certain lights. Rare's recreation of Pinbot is reasonably accurate, though a number of alterations were made. You can definitely tell this is a Rare game because of the little effects they throw in, like here on the Game Over screen when you enter in your initials for the high score. They took the time to add in like an animated cursor which changes perspective as it spins around. And, and this is like Rare in a nutshell. It, it always feels like their true passion is creating clever graphical effects rather than, you know, making a fun game. But Pinbot is actually pretty decent. There's quite a lot of stuff going on. As mentioned earlier, you travel from planet to planet, starting with Pluto and ending with the Sun. There's like a little galaxy on the table that shows you where you currently are. You can actually get uh, two balls in play simultaneously. And the game throws in various gimmicks, like a normal ball being replaced by a, like a polygonal shape ball. Later there will be enemies on the screen that can do awful things like destroy one of your flippers. Also of note, it uses an eye-catching blue and purple color scheme, which you might remember became faddish a couple years ago and for a while it felt like every album cover or movie poster was all blue and purple. So you might get some unintentional mid to late 2010 vibes from Pinbot. Overall, not a bad pinball game, and if you like video game pinball for some reason, you know, you'll probably like this, I guess. Oh hey, another Rare game. The rate at which Rare pumps these things out is astonishing. Not a bad music track from David Wise, what there is of it at least. For some reason you can only play with one or two players, despite there being a total of four contestants. And it appears that host Mark Summers did not allow his likeness to be used for this thing. The weird thing is though that the host is wearing a polo shirt rather than the tie-in jacket that Summers wore. Yeah, I definitely want a different character. Ditch this geek. Okay, this dude looks cool. The other team looked like total dorks. Now there are various sorts of challenges in this game and they mostly suck, uh, but this one is extremely unfair. Look at that, one, one try. Double Dare is a pretty simple trivia game with a few unusual enhancements, as we shall see. Like a lot of like trivia game show adaptations, the NES version gives you multiple choices for the answer, and you simply need to select the correct one. On the original TV show, the team wouldn't be giving any choices, they just had to know the answer. And of course, many of these questions would be pretty difficult for today's kids. Now, the game's big gimmick is that instead of answering the question, you can pass it back to the other team using the dare option, which doubles the stake. 
However, that team can then go right back and double dare you, which passes it back to you. And this doubles the money again. If the double dare is incorrectly answered, the other team gets the money. Now here's where the game goes off the rails. If you are double dared, you can then choose to take the physical challenge instead of trying to answer, which means you need to perform some ridiculous task in a certain period of time. These often in the, the actual TV show involve throwing things. So here, for example, you need to throw a water balloon into a basketball hoop. Most of these physical challenges are really annoying due to the game's like weird angle and speed meters. I never really could get the hang of using these things. The original Nickelodeon television show ran from 1986 to 1993 and was an immediate success. Aside from the trivia questions and physical challenges, the show also had an obstacle course in which contestants had to make their way through a number of wet and slippery environments. As time went by, the show became increasingly messy, presumably inspired by the popularity of the green slime from You Can't Do That on Television. In 1993, it was rebranded as, I kid you not, Super Sloppy Double Dare, and turned into a virtual orgy of goo and liquids. The scatological implication of the show was magnified by the fact that the set used like square tiled walls and floors, which made it resemble a bathroom. It's almost Cronenbergian in its sliminess. And perhaps we might find similarities between this and the performance art of the Vienna actionists, such as Otto Mule or Hermann Nietzsche. And I do actually wonder if there is some connection between kids watching this stuff and the sudden popularity of Bukaki porn in the US in the late 90s, early 2000s. Pornographer Jeff Mike, the man who brought the genre to the United States, says that after releasing his first Bukaki video in 1998, he was quote-unquote bombarded with positive responses, almost as if there was an existing audience just waiting for this kind of thing. What could have possibly warped the minds of viewers back then? Hmm, I wonder who. <laughs> Now the first video game version was released for computers in 1988 by Game Tech with exactly the same box art as the NES version. The DOS version is pretty damn ugly, but the questions seem a bit easier since they focus more on general knowledge rather than the very specific 80s TV pop cultural references in the NES game. Obviously, the graphics and music are much nicer in the NES version, but the game still kind of stinks. First of all, why is my teammate super high? We're on TV, lady. We're trying to make money. Get your act together. Here's a tough one in 2021. What type of product does Inspector 12 check out? Beats the heck out of me. Turns out it's a reference to Hanes underwear ads from the 1980s, which suggests that old ladies just totally maul your tidy whities before it ends up touching your junk. Is this also kind of a weird sex thing? Maybe? The physical challenges in this game are pretty annoying. As mentioned earlier, there are all sorts of challenges on the TV show, but the video game focuses mostly on throwing things at a target. Cake Catch, for example, has you catching cakes. You jump off a trampoline and try to catch a cake in the air. Many times it will just pass right through your body like a ghost cake. I think you might have to catch the cake while it's above your head. Other physical feats you must accomplish, bowling, which is pretty easy actually. There's also putty golf, where you play miniature golf with a weird looking egg. and ring toss, which is totally messed up. The rings have a shadow which is completely deceptive. Check this out. You can see the ring in the air above the U in the Double Dare logo. The shadow looks very close to the back wall. It looks like the ring is going to miss you by a mile, but it lands perfectly on your head. 
And then this next ring looks much closer, but just totally misses you. Rare, you really screwed this one up. Some of these, though, are super easy, like, um, pie in your pants? In which, well, they aren't even trying to hide the sexual connotations here. Or kangaroo catch, which is the same as pie in your pants, only you're trying to get a baby kangaroo down your pants. Jesus. Playing against the computer is tricky because it apparently randomly gets answers either right or wrong. So dare and double dare options are risky since it will just randomly know an answer that no 13-year-old in 1980 would know, like what Chubby Checker's real name is. Anyway, I rallied in the end and just stomped these dorks. After the game, you get the obstacle course, and naturally, Rare makes this really weird. You move by rapidly hitting the D-pad, alternating between left and right, I and mean, this causes you to move to the right. And just using the D-pad like this just feels really wrong. I, I can't think of any other game off the top of my head that does this. So like most Rare games, this is a weird combination of elements that feel pretty slick, like the music, and things that feel just completely unpolished, rushed, or just plain wrong, like the physical challenges and the obstacle course. Oh boy, here we go! A classic Kasogi game. A premier example of a game designed to rip off kids. Or at least rip off their parents. Dino Wars, the destruction of Spondylus? The name feels exactly like some long forgotten toy line or Saturday morning cartoon show. But no, this is in fact a completely original property, courtesy of Bandai. And, you know, based on the packaging, it looks promising. A dude in space armor shooting a cyborg dinosaur? That's pretty badass. And look at the back. Giant computerized dinosaurs? The deranged Dr. Brainius? Forbidden robotic experiments on human subjects? Cybosaurus must be unleashed? The screenshots make it look kind of like Metroid. Well, forget all that. Dino Wars is the most basic and repetitive entry imaginable in the walk to the right and kill stuff genre of video game. And I hope you like this room because you'll be seeing it a lot. Right off the bat, you'll realize that the platforming is not great. You go through several rooms of this. Most rooms have either a few of these flying things or a stationary laser cannon or two. And there are also going to be some platforms over a pit. Because most enemies are in the air, you'll need to jump while firing in order to hit them. After a few screens, you'll come to this robot dinosaur, and we get this one cool shot of it powering up. This is Cybosaurus, apparently the most powerful robot dinosaur in existence, though it doesn't come with any weapons other than your little tiny Tyrannosaurus arms. Yeah, you actually have to punch enemies until you find a weapons pickup. And you're also going to need to duck a lot because many of the dinosaurs are shorter than you. Okay, so here we found a weapon. There are four weapons in this game, and they are all very boring. This one just shoots a projectile. And this one is worse. It shoots a rocket-powered fist that moves in a rectangle and then returns to you. It functions, I guess, essentially like the first weapon, but with a slower rate of fire. 
Also worth noting, there are bottomless pits and enemies can push you into them, which will instantly kill you, of course. You have infinite continues as far as I can tell, but you do have to start the entire level over whenever you die. At the end of each level, you have a boss of sorts. One weird thing about these fights, the bosses tend to move pretty slowly, but often when you hit them with a laser or something, they will briefly speed up for a second. This might be a glitch, I'm not really sure. Also, the boss will always drop something, but I have no idea what it is and the manual does not seem to mention it. So for the second half of the level, you are on foot again. And if this looks familiar, that's because yes, this game uses the same handful of rooms over and over again. There are only like six or seven room layouts in this game. Finally, you reach the boss room, and this Metroid looking thing shoots at you, and you just shoot it back. Once you defeated it, well, here's the kicker. You then have to walk back through the rooms that you just cleared. There's no enemies, but you'll have to jump across all these pits again, and in the event that you fall into a pit, you will have to start this section over and then re-kill the boss thing. So once you return back to the surface, you beam out to the next planet and repeat for the next six planets. And here's the thing. At this point, you've seen the entire game meaning all the levels are functionally identical. Sure, the colors and textures are different, but they all play the same. Going forward, there are no new elements introduced into this game at all. This isn't like Super Mario Brothers, where you have a water level or a fiery level or the Hammer Brothers suddenly show up. It's just nothing but walking left to right, shooting at dinosaurs. Like quite a few Western-only games, there is no in-game mention of the story at all. Everything is explained only in the manual. So if you want to know what the hell Spondylus is, you'll need to check out page 3 and learn that it is an artificial solar system whose computers have been infected by a virus. This sounds actually kind of like Power Blade. Also, the evil Dr. Brainius has sent a bunch of Robosaurs to Spondylus to stop you, I assume. Your name is Dr. Proteus, by the way, and I assume that that blob-looking thing that you shoot at at the end of each level are the viruses? Like, literal, biological viruses in the computer, not computer viruses. Oh, and by the way, these flying things are referred to in the manual as the Flying Hounds of Destruction, and the platforms that you jump on, those are the Platforms of Deception. Now, this was published by Bandai, but was developed by none other than Advanced Communication, the guys behind Photon, the ultimate game on planet Earth, and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I guess it's kind of cool to see this sort of old-school garbage in 1990. This really feels like a game from the 1980s. Now, in my opinion, Dino Wars has sort of a Dash Galaxy vibe, where they created a game that really makes no sense, and then tried to come up with some kind of ridiculous explanation as to what the game is about. It also has very weird jumping physics, and the platforming is far and away the worst part of the game. Seriously, check this out right here. One thing that bugs me on a purely philosophical level is the utter waste of screen space. In the dinosaur levels, all the action happens in the bottom third of the screen. All of the space above this is not used at all. Even the flying enemies don't really enter this space, which gives the game a really archaic feel to it. Even Super Mario Brothers back in 1985 had figured out ways to use the upper two-thirds of the screen, as have later games such as Castlevania, Ninja Gaiden, Contra, but here the majority of the screen real estate is completely wasted in the dinosaur sections. Another problem is weapons pickups. They all look kind of the same, and you can't tell what they're supposed to represent when you see them. Ideally, pickups should be easily recognizable. 
think of the Fire Flower in Super Mario Brothers or the sub weapons in Castlevania. In addition, two of the weapons are absolutely useless. The pea shooter and the laser are really the only two worth using. The launch fist is very slow and has to return back to you before you can shoot it again. And the bombs are thrown in an arc, so unlike the laser, it's very possible to miss the target if you're using the bombs. You can power these weapons up one or two times, but if you die, you lose your weapon, which means that you can't screw up a single jump when going through the base sections. Otherwise, you'll start the dinosaur section in the next level with just your punching fist. So a few other things to note. That little spaceship thing you see at the top can be used once per planet, but only in the beginning of the dinosaur levels. All it does will just destroy everything on screen. Oh, by the way, in the manual, the dinosaur sections are referred to as dinosaur mode, which makes sense, I guess. And the parts where you're on foot, believe it or not, the manual calls this quote-unquote man mode. So, level 7 is the final level. After completing the dinosaur section, you once again make your way through several rooms of bottomless pits and enemies that you can only hit by jumping up in the air. One thing that's a little funny, the enemies that fly around over the pits can drop like a health or shield refill, but you can't pick them up because they just fall into the pit and disappear. As for the final boss, it's just the same virus thing exactly as in the last six levels. Once again, you just jump up in the air and shoot them. But the game's not over yet. Even on the last level, you need to go back through the previous rooms, jump over all the pits again, and if you fail to make a jump, you will have to play through this entire section again. Dino Wars is not officially beaten until you go all the way back and jump into your Cybosaurus, and then use the teleporter platform. So finally, the end. The programmer didn't want to use his real name on this, I guess. And this last screen here is just like twisting in the knife. So definitely one of the least enjoyable and most frustrating games I've played recently, due not only to every aspect of Dino Wars just sucking, but also due to the extreme repetitiveness of the game. You essentially play the same level seven times in a row. But you know, little kids love repetitive stuff, so I'm sure a lot of people have nostalgic feelings for this game. But if you try playing this for the first time as an adult, you will absolutely hate it. Oh boy, another entry from the House of Kitchen, Ghostbusters 2. Now before we go any further along, let's address the mystery surrounding this logo. Namely, what's going on with the lower half of this ghost? Is that a foot? Does he only have one leg? Or, as you know, cartoon ghosts are often drawn without legs, having sort of a tail instead? I mean, probably this is originally derived from the idea of ghosts wearing a ragged shroud or a burial cloth. Now, this is the official Ghostbusters 2 logo as it appears on posters and such. It also does appear on the Ecto-1 in the movie itself, indicating that the Ghostbusters themselves were aware that they were in a sequel. However, the opening credits in Ghostbusters 2 clearly show a two-legged ghost, with his right leg partially obscured. Who decided to remove the second leg, and why? I guess we'll never know. Now, Ghostbusters 2 is kind of a screwed up game, and it has this weird attract screen sequence. It starts off with a little animated intro. Okay, not bad. 
Then it goes into this long demo of the game's driving sequence and gives you some gameplay tips. And this lasts for a good full minute. Then the game credits roll. The game was designed by Dan Kitchen, Gary's brother, and developed by Imagineering, of course. Published by Activision. We recently covered Imagineering's A Boy and His Blob and Destination Earth Star. And then after the credits, the game's actual intro starts up where the plot is explained. Was this written by Travis Bickle? It then repeats the whole sequence until you hit the start button. The whole thing is like a good three minutes long, which has got to be the record for the longest attract mode sequence on an NES game. And this is the only way to see the game's intro with the plot summary. If you hit a button at any point during this, the game will officially start and you'll miss all of this. Okay, so once the game itself actually starts, you'll get this monologue from Vigo, the Scourge of Carpathia, then a scene of the Ghostbusters ascending into the sewers or the subway or whatever the hell this is. Apparently in the movie, the Ghostbusters have new weapons that shoot slime. Now, I'll be honest, I saw Ghostbusters 2 in the theater when it came out, and I have not seen it or probably even thought about it since then. And if you were to ask me to summarize the movie, I'd say, well, there's an evil painting that's going to destroy New York, and the Statue of Liberty comes to life, and that's actually all I remember. Ghostbusters 2 is what I would call a modular game. It has two distinct styles of gameplay. One where you walk from right to left, shooting enemies above you and avoiding obstacles. The second mode is the driving sections, where you avoid obstacles in the road by changing lanes and occasionally having to jump over large holes in the ground. Now, I'll be blunt, this game is frustrating, repetitive, and just plain obnoxious. The driving sequences remind me of Battletoads, though not quite as bad. These sections do require memorization, and they kind of feel like they were added in to keep you from finishing the game too quickly. There are tons of different types of enemies, and some will kill you while some will merely slow you down. But regardless, the sheer amount of fast-moving shit this game throws at you is just obnoxious. Like these damn briefcases which just move way too fast. One way of dealing with these obnoxious enemies is by setting up a ghost trap. I don't remember what these things are actually called in the movie. And apparently this level is set in a courthouse. Okay, here's another driving sequence. Then, okay, this is definitely a subway. I feel like I'm back in a, a boy in his blob. So much stuff just comes rushing at you in this section. I mean, look how fast that bat is. Okay, now we have the Statue of Liberty level. This is similar to the on foot levels, except you're attacked only by enemies above you, and there's no jumping here. Suddenly the game like turns into Galaga. All these ghosts move around in patterns and you shoot them down. One thing that's just a bizarre about this level is how it starts off with these relatively aggressive enemies who will just constantly swoop down and attack you, which leads to pretty much unavoidable deaths. And then there's much mellower sections where they just fly overhead and it's more like a shooting gallery. Also, in most levels, when you shoot enemies, they explode into a little tiny bloody explosion, but here the enemies shrink into a little gray wisp and vanish. It's a tiny detail, but it shows just how inconsistent the design of everything is in this game. It feels like three different games were designed, then separately just cobbled together to make one long game. Someone, maybe Frank Cifaldi, said these games from companies like Imagineering feel like they came from a universe where Nintendo and Super Mario Bros. didn't exist, and the game play styles just continued to evolve from the Atari 2600. Now, the movie got a huge promotional push. After all, the original Ghostbusters was Columbia's biggest moneymaker ever, and they were banking on Ghostbusters 2 making a ton of money as well. Unfortunately for Columbia, Ghostbusters 2 underperformed at the box office. Uh, several hundred people, and they sat through the entire movie. They were there to have a good time. There was one laugh. One laugh in two hours. Still, there were multiple different Ghostbusters 2 games released on various platforms, starting with 1989's Ghostbusters 2 from Activision. Developed by Dynamics, the guys behind Mech Warrior and Betrayal at Crondor, among other things.
this was much more faithful to the film and seemed more interested in accurately representing scenes in the movie. It also makes use of voice samples, scanned photographs, and so on. We got one! There may have been a foot fetishist working on this though. I mean, this is definitely a very interesting way to depict the Statue of Liberty scene. Also, notice the NES controller here. Though in the movie itself, uh, instead of having a regular NES controller, it was a NES Advantage that appeared. Kind of weird that the DOS game shows a regular NES controller and the NES version doesn't. In October 1990, a game called Ghostbusters 2 was released in Japan for the Game Boy. It had the exact same box art image as the NES game, but was a completely different game. It was developed by HAL and featured chibi versions of the Ghostbusters walking through various movie locations and busting ghosts. Activision later released this in the US. Also, we have the confusingly named New Ghostbusters 2, released by HAL in Japan in December 1990. This is just an expanded version of the Game Boy title, with six levels instead of three. This was not released in the US, probably because Activision already had a different Ghostbusters game released here. And finally, Sega put out their own Ghostbusters game on the Genesis, which doesn't appear to be based on any specific Ghostbusters property. But this is all still clearly part of the Ghostbusters marketing blitz of 1989 and 1990. Now, once you've finished the Endless Statue of Liberty section, you end up at the museum and... You know, maybe I was a little bit too hasty about the NES version not having any foot fetish content. Okay, so another on foot section, this time through the museum, and once again all sorts of annoying crap is flying around. I should point out this game's rather generous system for getting extra lives. Every 20 Ghostbusters logos that you collect, you'll get an extra life. And in the second half of the game, there's like a lot of these things, especially in the Statue of Liberty section. In the on foot section, you can also suck them up by setting ghost traps. So really, you can rack up quite a few extra lives if you actively try to collect these things. I have no idea if this is something that's actually taken from the movie, but for the very final level, each of the four Ghostbusters has to go through the museum level one at a time. So essentially, you have to play this level four times in a row. And you know, I assume that Double Dare would be the only video game where I'd have to bring up Bukaki. However, well, here we are. Yep, the end. No final boss fight, that's it. It was also, I guess, kind of the case for Destination Earth Star. Once you knocked out the last enemy base, the game was just over, rather anticlimactically, no pun intended. All right, let's proceed to something completely different. Hey, it's our last US only game for the month of April, Ivan Iron Man Stewart's Super Off-Road. Why does this look like the Del Monte logo? Published by Trade West and developed by, take a wild guess, Rare, their third game this episode. And this game is just full of smoking hot chicks in swimsuits. You get to choose the country you represent. Also note the Leland logos on this screen. This 3D lettering with the reflections and stuff just looks like it was designed by Rare. It didn't appear in the original arcade game. 
So this is a racing game in the style of Atari's Sprint game series. We covered Super Sprint several episodes ago. You drive around a little track which is sort of awkwardly designed to fit a rectangular arcade cabinet or TV screen. The gimmick is that the track is full of bumps, inclined surfaces, and rocks, simulating the rough terrain of off-road racing. So your truck bounces around while you're driving. You can go over the obstacles like rocks, but it will slow you down. You win money at the end of each race, and you can use this to either upgrade your tire, shocks, that kind of thing, also your acceleration and your T-speed. Now, Ivan, Iron Man, Stewart, was a real person, an off-road race driver who racked up an impressive series of trophies from the 70s through the 90s in competitions like the Baja 500. In 1989, Leland released Super Off-Road as an arcade game, one of those big three-player cabinets. This portrait of Stewart is way more flattering than the one in the NES game. And this also lists Stewart's various racing accomplishments. The arcade game uses these big blue pools of water, something which is completely missing from the NES version. Also, the swimsuit models show off a bit more skin. The whole arcade game is obviously a lot more pleasing to the eye, and this was successful enough to get ported to pretty much every computer system. Sensitive viewers might want to shield their eyes from this next image, Yes, this is the ZX Spectrum version. Ouch. Various sequels have trickled out over the years. The Super Nintendo got a version, and the N64 had a 3D version. There were cell phone ports, so this game actually had a pretty long lifespan. Due to the color limitations, I guess, the NES version didn't have any pools of water, but it did have the option for four players, as the rather ugly box cover points out. I mean, the Drew Stusen-esque painting is fine, but damn, there's a lot of text boxes and logos crammed on this thing. I suppose the strategy for winning this thing is to use the nitro strategically. You have several tanks of nitro, which gives you a sudden burst of speed. In the upper middle area of the screen, it shows the number of tanks that you have, and you can buy more, or even better, pick up tanks for free on the racetrack. You can also pick up extra money sometimes. Not a bad game, I guess. It's just one of those things that were apparently much more entertaining back in the day. Alright, here we are, the last game of April 1990, and one of the last big games for the Famicom. I mean, we'll still have Mega Man 3, and Chip and Dale, and Dr. Mario coming up, and there are plenty of cult classics like Gimmick or Little Samson, not to mention Western-only releases like Star Tropics, but for the most part, the Mario's, the Zelda's, the Castlevania's, and the Dragon Quest and the Final Fantasies, all that stuff is moving to the Super Famicom, which, as I will remind you, is a mere six months away from where we are this episode. Final Fantasy III was, of course, not originally released in the US, but has been unofficially translated several times over the last couple decades. I'm using the Chaos Rush patch from 2019. Final Fantasy III returns somewhat to the style of the first game. Rather than having predefined characters in your party, as you did in Final Fantasy II, you choose four party members from several classes, and you need to give them names and so on. It also brings back various concepts from Final Fantasy I, such as crystals, the four warriors of light, and so on, 
but it does add one very significant change in the mechanics. The story begins in media res, with four orphans falling down a hole and landing in a cave. The first thing you need to do is give these little shits some names. Then you start looking for an exit. You immediately come across some appropriately disgusting looking monsters which you need to fight. And you'll then find some potions and a shield. This came out a little over two months after Dragon Quest IV, but the two games could not be more different. For example, Dragon Quest IV begins with a cutscene laying out the plot. You then begin the game by exploring the castle, buying equipment, traveling to a nearby village, climbing down a well, then exploring a cave, and finally reaching the first boss. By contrast, in Final Fantasy III, the first boss fight happens about four minutes into the game. Luckily, you will have found in a previous room uh, an item which casts a powerful wind spell, which allows you to take down this giant turtle relatively easily. After this encounter, the first of several crystals in the game will appear. Final Fantasy just loves crystals, especially talking crystals. This crystal basically tells you the world is going to end unless you four dudes do something to save it. Though, quite frankly, the crystal is pretty vague about what exactly you're supposed to do, and then we cut to the opening credits and theme music. The usual suspects show up here. Sakaguchi, Miyamoto, Tarada, Tanaka, art by Uematsu, and programmed by Nasser Gabelli. Now at this point, technically you can leave the cave, but this wouldn't be a proper JRPG if it didn't have you searching for loot at all times. So let's poke around, find a hidden passageway, open up some treasure chests, you'll find money, or gill as the game calls it, and some equipment like a long sword and nunchucks. Alright, now here comes the important part. Final Fantasy III would have been a perfectly fine 8-bit RPG if it just carried over the mechanics of the first. But you know, what elevates it above the Dragon Quest and the earlier Final Fantasies, and all the other JRPGs that we've seen so far, is the job system. Final Fantasy I and Dragon Quest III gave you options to upgrade your class. For example, in Final Fantasy I, you could upgrade the Warrior to the Knight, or the Black Mage to Black Wizard, which gave you new abilities. In Dragon Quest III, you could change class at the Dharma Temple, resetting you back to level 1, but keeping the spells that you learned. On the other hand, Final Fantasy III allows you to change your class at literally any point in the game, as long as you have the necessary capacity points. New jobs are made available throughout the game by each of the four crystals. So at this point, the Wind Crystal has given us the first five basic jobs. Fighter, Monk, White Wizard, Black Wizard, and Red Wizard. Winning battles gives both experience points and capacity points. Capacity points are what you spend when you want to change class. Different jobs can use different types of equipment and cast different magic spells. By the way, your default job at the very beginning is the Onion Knight, which is the absolute worst job, so probably the first thing you want to do here is switch to something better. Okay, so once you've got your party set up, you'll leave the cave and head back to your hometown and speak to the village elders, who tell you that you now have a huge responsibility to save the world and so on. 
And of course, since you also found some scratch in the cave, you can buy spells in the magic shop, as well as some additional armor and weapons. Spells and equipment can only be used by certain jobs. And while you don't like actually lose magic spells by switching jobs, there are some jobs that can't use magic or can only use limited amounts of magic. So if you are a white wizard and you know the heal spell, and then you switch to a black wizard, you won't be able to cast heal until you switch back to a white wizard or another job that actually has the ability to cast that spell. You don't lose the spell per se, you just can't cast it when you're in certain jobs. So once you talk to everyone and root around in the grass looking for hidden items, you can head out. And there's a lot of hidden items in this game. I hit the jackpot here. Now before long, you'll find a village where everyone's been turned into a ghost, I guess, by a genie. In this bar, you'll find Sid in his second Final Fantasy appearance. He lends you his airship, which just happens to be parked in a nearby desert. Once you board this thing, you're basically traveling in style. And this is just one of several airships that you get in this game. Final Fantasy loves airships, like Dragon Quest loves wagons. Final Fantasy III opens up the world map to you bit by bit. Much of the game is about finding ways to get to previously unaccessible areas. So here, Sid's ship can't fly over the mountains and can't get past that giant rock, so you're pretty much boxed in. But you can get to this castle. As it turns out, everyone at the castle is also cursed by the genie. He gets around, and he's taken the princess to his cave. And while you're here, you should of course investigate the castle for loot. Here's blizzard magic, which can be used by a black wizard. This of course will cast an ice attack. As always, the art is excellent with tons of creepy monsters, and all or almost all of the art being used is brand new. As before, enemies can hit you with status elements, but it doesn't seem quite as bad as in Final Fantasy 1, where it seemed like you were just constantly getting poisoned or blinded. The genie, or Jin as this translation calls him, uses a bunch of magic attacks. But once you defeat him, Sarah seals him with a magic ring and the curse is lifted. As thanks for saving everyone, the king gives you a canoe, also found in Final Fantasy I, which allows you to travel in rivers. Before you leave, you can visit the princess and sleep in her bed. So after using Sid's airship to destroy the giant boulder block in your way, you can use the canoe to reach this mountain. In a bit straight out of Sinbad, Bahamut grabs you and puts you in his nest. Up to this point, Final Fantasy III felt like a standard RPG with its village, dungeon, village, dungeon rhythm, but here things start to get a little bonkers. You'll meet Desh, or Dash as he's often called, who is suffering from memory loss. His sprite looks confusingly like the fighter sprite, but the Amano artwork is significantly different. We then get an impossible battle against Bahamut, who in Final Fantasy is a dragon instead of a sea creature. You need to run from the battle, and running in this game is not fun, since it fails almost all the time. Desh teaches you the mini spell for free, since that particular spell is required in order to progress the plot. Yeah. 
so you shrink down to mini size and enter the gnome village. The gnome village is hilarious because the shops and stuff are all full size, but the people are tiny. And look how freaking adorable you are. So you need to cure this guy, and he'll show you a secret passage, which is filled with monsters, but in mini form, your attack power drops to literally nothing. Thus, your best option is to run from every single battle. Final Fantasy III can be just a little sadistic, but one of the worst parts are the mini sections, and there are several of them in this game. I mean, on one hand, it's very clever. It completely changes the dynamics of the game for these parts, but it's also sadistic because you are virtually helpless in mini form, and attempting to run from battles frequently fails, so you can just get pounded by enemies here. Now once you're out of that tiny passage, you can recast many and return to your full-size form. Turns out you've entered a pirate lair, though the game calls them Vikings, not pirates. As always, you want to just completely ransack the place, looking for hidden treasure everywhere. You definitely will have to purchase stuff in Final Fantasy III, but a lot of the best weapons and armor you find in treasure chests. So I just found some pretty sick spells here, Thundara and Blizzara. That's how Final Fantasy spell naming conventions work. So fire, for example, goes from weakest to strongest as fire, fira, and firaga. They just keep adding extra syllables onto the word. The pirates need to retrieve a stolen eye from a statue, which has been taken by a rat who's hiding in this temple. However, you need to shrink down to mini size to find him. And this part right here is kind of where the game just totally starts punching you in the nuts. Since you have to run from monsters in this dungeon, and then fight the rat boss in mini form. And then when you fight the rat boss, you can really only use magic or items. Because you have no attack power, you're stuck in mini form. And the game gave me a random encounter one step before the boss battle. One funny thing, though, is when you die in mini form, you become flattened, like a pancake. This is just one of those details that makes Final Fantasy III so much fun. And the job system is actually kind of handy in this case, because you can change all your fighters to magic users for this part. And one very critical thing about Final Fantasy III is flexibility, and not forgetting to actually use the job system. Anyway, you've upgraded from a canoe to a boat now, so you can explore new lands. You can find the Chocobo Forest nearby, with Chocobos making their second appearance in the series. For some important plot exposition, we head to Gurgen Gulch, or Golgen Gulch, as it's referred to in the English version. A Gurgen was mentioned in the intro at the very beginning of the game, and they are kind of like monks or something who can see into the future. And they also give you the toad spell, which is yet another shrinking spell. Yes, you've got to head off to a flooded tower and turn into toads so you can swim underwater. On top of the tower, you'll encounter Medusa for some reason, 
JRPGs just love throwing in monsters from different cultures in a completely willy-nilly fashion. She's not too tough like most of the bosses so far, and the game kind of lulls you into a false sense of security, but um, the bosses will get much rougher soon. After she's dead, Desh's memory will suddenly return, and it turns out he's the guardian of this tower, and he overslept, so now it's going to blow up. He jumps into the furnace to fix it, and so the tower will not fail and cause the continent to fall out of the sky. Yeah, so apparently the whole world that you've been exploring is on a floating landmass. Anyway, Desh is yet another character death in what's becoming sort of like a, a Final Fantasy tradition in this point. You might recall that a whole bunch of dudes died in Final Fantasy II. So keep exploring the area and you'll find this place, where the famous Gissel Greens are grown. One thing you have to do here, this dude sells magic keys. Buy about 10 of them because you'll need them way later in the game, and you won't have to worry about having a thief in the party to open locked doors. And speaking of thieves, you can sneak behind this poor old dude and steal the contents of his treasure chest. Some more classic Final Fantasy moments here. This lady will dance, and you can also play the piano. And then there's also a hidden passageway that leads to this person who suggests that you write to the Square Development Team with your opinions about Final Fantasy. One interesting bit of trivia is that much of the work done on Final Fantasy III was done right here in Sacramento, California. Nasir Cabelli apparently had some problems with his work visa in Japan and got kicked out of the country. So he returned to his hometown of Sacramento, and Square set up a temporary office there in town so that they could continue work on the game. Final Fantasy III is, I suppose, one of the city's major pop cultural exports, along with, I don't know, the Deftones and the movie Lady Bird? At this time, Square had, perhaps, too much on its plate. It certainly seemed that Square was planning on releasing Final Fantasy III in the U.S. This is a promotional image, which certainly suggests that. But eventually they decided to focus its energies on the upcoming Super Famicom projects like Final Fantasy IV. And of course, Square released an enormous number of RPGs over the next couple years for the Super Famicom and Game Boy. Like, seven games in 1990 and 1991 alone. It seems like every single 2D Final Fantasy game has been ported a million times, but Final Fantasy III was unlucky when it came to ports and re-releases. A Wonderswan version was planned, but never completed. And it was never even officially cancelled, it just disappeared without a trace. Unofficial fan translations have been released since the 1990s, but we did not get an official English version until 2006 when a 3D remake was released for the Nintendo DS. Great, so now we finally get to see exactly what the characters look like. Instead of fat babies running around in their underoos, they all have like these boy band haircuts. In many ways, this game is pretty faithful to the original. However, there are a lot of significant changes. In modern-day era JRPGs, you can't just start the game with a full party. 
You have to introduce the characters one by one and get their backstory and everything. So here you actually play through the first dungeon with a single character. It feels like the encounter rate is quite a bit higher, but as before, the boss fight with the giant turtle is made possible with a couple Antarctic winds. However, the crystal is much less talkative, and you don't get the ability to change jobs at this point. The fact that in the original Final Fantasy III, it like introduces its unique game mechanic maybe five minutes into the game, that might seem a little weird for audiences in the 2000s, an era in which JRPGs just acquired like a ton of build-up for absolutely everything. Final Fantasy XIII is perhaps the worst example of this. A lot of the minor details are the same, however, the placement of secrets and items, for example. You meet the second party member here, and of course he has to have a character arc to go through. He leaves town, and you follow him so he doesn't get into trouble. He wants to enter the cursed town on a dare to show that he's not afraid. And apparently you need to like grind more in this game because I got instantly wasted when I encountered the first enemy entering the genie's cave. And over the years, this version got ported many times to things like cell phones, the PSP, the uh, oh yeah, as I believe it's pronounced, the oh yeah, as well as just Microsoft Windows platforms. Finally, in the summer of 2021, Square released a port of the original, done in the style of the Super Nintendo Final Fantasy games. So you can now easily play an official English 2D version of Final Fantasy III after about 30 years since the original release. Though it does offer some modern amenities for today's spoiled crybaby gamers, such as auto battles, a world map, and quote unquote rebalancing. One of the biggest changes is that capacity points have been removed, so you can change jobs as much as you like. There's also new music that kind of sucks in my opinion, and a font that literally everyone hates. Alright, so after some more tromping through various dungeons, you will encounter the Salamander, the second boss who's holding a crystal hostage, I guess? Each of these four crystals unlock new jobs, so we get to power up now. We have Ranger, Knight, Thief, and Scholar. Ranger, which probably no one actually uses, attacks with bows, but then you have to buy expendable arrows to use as ammunition. Now Knight is a straight upgrade from the fighter. This guy becomes a physical attack powerhouse. He looks like the fighter, but he has like a cool cape and headpiece. The thief can open locked doors and steal items from monsters, and the scholar uses books to attack monsters with and to cast magic spells. But for the moment, I'm leaving everyone but the fighter in the same job. Now, in addition to gnomes in this game, there are also dwarves, who all say stuff like lolly ho. When you retrieve their horn, they will give you a ton of treasure. Just be aware, a lot of armor and weapons are specific to certain jobs, so you will find lots of loot that you just can't use and will end up selling. Now, one thing I detested about Dragon Quest IV was the inventory. Each character has a small number of slots, which get filled up very easily, and you will often have to juggle items around from character to character when you need to have an item transferred from one character to the other. It was perhaps the thing I hated most about Dragon Quest IV, the damned inventory system. Final Fantasy III solves this in two ways, or rather three ways. So, one, you have a single shared inventory. Items are not held by individual characters. So if you have an unequipped weapon in the inventory, 
Any character capable of using that item can equip it. The weapon does not have to be placed in their inventory first. There are a total of 32 inventory spaces, but what you say, that's like, there are like 8 characters in Dragon Quest 4 and, and each had 8 spaces. That's twice as many as Final Fantasy 3, right? True, but here's the thing. Equipped weapons don't take up inventory spaces in Final Fantasy 3. When you're playing Dragon Quest 4, equipped items take up like half of each character's inventory. So there's a huge amount of space freed up by not having weapons take up inventory spaces. And finally, the big one, each of the 32 inventory spaces can hold 99 of any particular item. So five potions don't take up five spaces, it takes up one. Thus, you can, in theory, have 99 potions. So you could carry a total of 3,188 items in Final Fantasy III if you include equipped armor and weapons. And furthermore, even if your inventory is full, you can still stash stuff into the fat Chocobo, who makes his first appearance in this game. Later in the game, he actually hangs out on your airship, so he's basically an infinite storage unit. Okay, so going back to the plot here, this guy, Hein, who's a very uh, fashionably dressed ghost sea captain, and he's a little tough. He's very difficult to hit with physical attacks, and he's only vulnerable to one type of magic attack, which will change every turn. And this is like the one time where having a scholar in the party comes in handy, since he can scan Hein and tell you what his current vulnerability is. After this, the game will throw a big switcheroo at you. So once you get this special part for the ship, Sid will turn it into a combination ship slash airship. And at this point, you can get on the airship, fly into the clouds, and leave the floating island and enter the real world. You don't have a world map in this game, but you do have a sight spell which shows you your immediate surroundings. Okay, so once you find this specific little island here, you can look for the third crystal, the water crystal, but you need to rescue some chick named Aria first. And yeah, we have a another dramatic death here. Alright, next up we have to fight the third crystal boss, Kraken, who's not that tough. Killing him causes like a big earthquake to happen and you wake up in an inn three days later. The good news is that the water crystal has unlocked new jobs, including the absolutely tank-like black belt job and some weird jobs like Geomancer who uses elemental attacks that don't require magic points. I have a lot of capacity points by now, so I make the very unwise decision to change my Red Knight into a Magic Knight, which I believe was called a Dark Knight in the later remake of the game. Magic Knights are great, except that they have very limited choices for equipment. 
In fact, at this point in the game, there are no weapons or armor that they can use. However, one great thing about Final Fantasy III is that you can change your mind quite easily, as long as you have enough capacity points. Most of the second half of the game is spent out in this large world, which has three big continents and several islands, as well as some underwater locations. If we look at a picture of the world map, we'll find that it looks vaguely like Earth, with two large land masses that sort of resemble the Americas and then Eurasia and Africa. And there's also a large island which I guess looks kind of like a mega Australia. After your airship is shot down, you end up here. Now the main drama here is that this king has gone crazy and kicked out his son, the prince. First, you need to rescue the prince from these golden knights. Then you need to take him back to the castle. The city here has sort of like a unique layout. It's divided into four distinct areas on the overworld. And you'll find various points of interest in each of the four sections. Eventually the king lets you into the castle, but it turns out the king is being mind controlled by a malicious force. The boss battles up to this have not been too tricky, but Garuda will absolutely wreck you if you don't handle the fight correctly. Changing everyone to Dragoons will be very helpful. In fact, it'll probably be absolutely necessary, since if you're up in the air when Garuda hits you with lightning, you won't take any damage. but there's still definitely an element of luck here. Oh yeah, and one thing I do like in Final Fantasy III is that different jobs have like unique death sprites. After defeating Garuda, the prince is restored to the throne and life returns to normal in the city. And oh yeah, these nerds build you a brand new airship. You will get various upgrades to the ship later, allowing it to go underwater and fly over certain mountains. But first up, we have to go to Doga's Manor, where we meet Moggles for the first time. Doga joins your party and you are again forced to use the mini spell to travel through a mouse hole in an utterly hateful journey to some kind of underground cave.
Once you've gotten all the way through the cave, you are able to upgrade your airship and also awaken someone named Uni? I'm not quite sure what the correct pronunciation is. Now I will admit, the, the plot of Final Fantasy III with its crystals and prophecies and mysterious figures lurking in the background, at this point I couldn't really make a whole lot of sense out of it. I mean, at least Dragon Quest IV was not nearly as new agey, and the characters had some pretty well-defined goals, like avenging your father's death and such. In Final Fantasy III, the story just seems kind of like a series of contrivances to keep you going from one place to the other. That's not necessarily a bad thing, that's actually how a lot of JRPGs work, but compared to Dragon Quest IV, Final Fantasy III is much more focused on mechanics and player choice. Dragon Quest IV allows you to choose party members, but each character is ready-made and comes with a specific set of stats and magic. Final Fantasy III allows you to add and remove magic spells at your leisure. Magic spells are essentially equipable items, even though each job has limitations on whether you can cast white or black magic, or whether you can use magic at all. So I suppose you could say there's no right way to play Final Fantasy III. I mean, not all jobs are equal. I'm sure folks have played through it with unusual party combinations, but using a party of, say, two bards and two scholars would be very difficult. Also, since each job can only equip certain items, the game has many, many types of armor and weapons. Aside from regular swords, you also have knives and katanas. Magic users have rods, staves, books, and bells, and then various other jobs might require nunchucks, axes, bows, claws, hammers, spears, boomerangs, and oh yes, let's not forget harps. There are weapon shops, but the game is very generous with the loot. Many dungeons have tons of treasure chests containing weapons and armor, often very expensive armor. And there, of course, there's also many, many, many items that range from health and magic refills to those that inflict status ailments on enemies. In other words, there's just an astonishing amount of stuff in Final Fantasy III. Odin is another tough boss that is made easier by switching to dragoons. When defeated, he drops an item that will allow him to be summoned in battle. So we can add summons to the list of things introduced in Final Fantasy III that went on to become series mainstays. a fake group of warriors of the light wandering around. These four losers. As you might recall, Dragon Quest IV had a similar group of counterfeits that you encountered a few times throughout the game. Naturally, these guys can't take the heat and you have to rescue them. Okay, so one of the overarching narratives in Final Fantasy III involves finding better and better airships. The game world is laid out so that there are geographical obstacles blocking your path forward, until you obtain a ship capable of bypassing those obstacles. So it's now time to find the final airship. To do so, you will need the help of Une, a withered old crone who's been asleep for years. You awaken her by playing Noah's Lute, which you found earlier in the game. Une is one of Noah's three disciples, the other two being Doga and Zandi. Zandi is the renegade disciple who basically started the whole mess. Incidentally, Uni gives you a Fire Fang, one of the four fangs in this game whose purpose will be revealed later. 
For the moment though, they just take up inventory space and you can't drop them. The ship is buried in these ancient ruins. There's some kind of archaeological expedition going on, but only Unui has the power to destroy these large boulders blocking your path. At the bottom of these ruins you will find the biggest and baddest airship, the Invincible. Unlike all other airships, you can walk around on deck, and it has a lot of amenities. There's shops on board and a bed, so you can refill your HP and MP at no cost. There's even a fat chocobo on board. This is a very convenient upgrade and time saver, since you no longer have to fly to a village or the chocobo forest in order to heal or stash items. In terms of a transportation device, the Invincible has the ability to fly over narrow sections of mountain ranges, unlocking previously unaccessible areas. First up is Falgabard, a village full of magic knights who make mention of dark blades. If you're thinking, hey, am I finally going to get some magic knight equipment? The answer is yes, and it's about time. First, let's find a sword. Behind this waterfall is a hidden cave, often blocked by this idiot who likes to walk around on the secret path. So after waiting for about a half hour until he finally leaves, you can then go down the path and find this old dude who challenges you to a fight. And then he gives you the sword when you defeat him. Magic knights wield katanas, the most powerful swords known to man. You can also buy some demon armor for your magic knight in the shops. The magic knight is a pretty great fighter who can also cast a few magic spells, and he'll be useful up to the final area of the game. Unfortunately, your joy will immediately turn to tears when you enter this next dungeon, because the monsters in this cave will split in two if you attack them with conventional physical weapons. Only magic spells, or the magic knight's weapons, can be used against them, so a regular knight or fighter is completely useless. Now I guess I could have changed the black belt dude to a black wizard, but that would mean buying new spells and armor for him, so I just sort of suffered through this dungeon. The reward for getting through this cave is some powerful magic knight weapons and armor. So now that we've toughened up our party, we can check out some other places. Now earlier in the game, back when you were on the floating continent, we may have noticed a lake with like a dark shape swimming in it. We can now fly over the mountains surrounding the lake and enter an underwater cave, where you encounter Leviathan, who will also, just like Odin, drop a summon spell when defeated. Now, if you hated having to fight the monsters in Falgabard Cave, you'll then hate the Cave of Darkness even more, since it's more the same, except it's much bigger and with harder monsters. If you're smart enough, you can change to two Magic Knights, but I was too stubborn to do this. and final fang. Okay, so what are these damn fangs that we have to carry around? Well, what they do, aside from taking up inventory space, is there's this valley which is guarded by some sort of defense system that looks like statues, which blocks you from passing through. Due to some sort of mechanism, which I do not understand, each of the four fangs will destroy one of the barriers in the valley. I now have the fourth thing, so I can take out the final barrier and reach the final area of the game. By the way, did I mention that the Invincible is armed? When you get a random encounter in the air, it will begin with your ship firing cannonballs at the enemy. The Invincible is just so cool.
Entering the Ancient's Maze will immediately lead you to the fourth and final crystal, guarded by the Titan. Just like with the previous crystals, this will unlock the fourth and final wink wink set of jobs. Summoner is an upgraded evoker, and the Warlock and Shaman are updated black and white wizards. This translation, by the way, is based on the modern day official square translations, so instead it calls them Magus and Devout. So if you were using wizards in your party, there is absolutely no reason to not immediately upgrade to these two new jobs. And as a bonus, the Devout's outfit is hella cute. So unfortunately, now comes the game's I have to kill Tony Hawk moment. Une and Doga say that you have to fight them in order to get the key to the area where all the really good equipment is kept. You battle them one at a time, and after wasting them both, they will hand over the keys to the two areas in the final dungeon. Yes, the last dungeon is actually like four dungeons. It's a really big dungeon. So before you get started, you need to get prepped. Make sure you have lots of high potions and various ailment curing items like eye drops to cure blindness, softs to cure petrification, though this translation calls them golden needles. Check the fat chocobo for anything you might need, and any old armor or weapons or generally useless items should be sold. Now, to be clear, the last dungeon is brutal. It is long, filled with many tough enemies, and a crap load of boss fights. There's like 11 bosses we're going to have to face in this dungeon. In the final world of Dragon Quest IV, there were like, I think, 5 bosses total, and a couple of them barely even qualified as bosses. I guess this chick is not related to the dude from the Avengers movies? So once you get past the first part of the dungeon, you'll need to use the Eureka Key to enter the Forbidden Land Eureka. And to me, this name is kind of silly sounding because our state's motto is Eureka, and we typically associate the word with the discovery of gold. And there's kind of a touristy little city named Eureka up in Humboldt County. That's where they grow all the weed. So the name doesn't have any connotations of mystery or danger to us here. There is a lot of loot though. Here's the game's first ribbon. It's guarded by a ninja, who are tougher than most of the enemies we've seen so far. This ribbon not only has pretty good defense stats, but also makes you immune to status ailments and offers resistance against elemental attacks. So it's the best helmet in the game, with one exception. 
There are five ribbons in the final dungeon, and they are all guarded by tough enemies. So as you go through the dungeons, you'll find lots of loot, including uh, the strongest armor and weapons, such as the shuriken, which are one-use weapons which do a lot of damage. You'll definitely need to get a few of these, and I'm basically saving them all up for the final boss. Alright, so time for the Eureka boss rush. You can do them in any order. I'll do easiest to hardest. Amon is a very swank skeleton pirate, and he likes to blast the party with fire. He goes down easier than your mom after two Midori Sours. I ended up not even using the weapon he dropped. Next is Kunoichi, who is basically just Electra from the Daredevil comics. She can cast some annoying status ailments and paralyze two of my party members. Unfortunately, I neglected to equip my Asuna spell, which is what cures status elements in this game. But you know, there's just so many damn spells in this game that it's pretty easy to forget one. And there is no item that can clear paralysis, so I was pretty worried, but then my magic knight just slaughtered her the next turn. for defeating her is Masamune, the most powerful katana. It has an attack power of uh, 160 versus 125 of the So let's take a moment and examine some of the other jobs. The Viking is a pure physical attack character with good defense stats, who uses axes and hammers as weapons, and can equip some of the strongest armor in the game. There's nothing wrong with him per se, but it just seems like the Karateka is better. Both the Karateka and the Viking are unlocked at the Water Crystal level. I mean, I guess you could go with a Viking and a Karateka as your physical damage guys instead of the Knight, but it is kind of a strange choice. Now, the Thief is pretty much useless except in a few situations. He has an Escape skill, which is kind of like the Run command, only it succeeds more frequently. He can equip a Boomerang, and can open locked doors if you don't have the Magic Keys but generally not someone that you're going to use very often. The Bard is interesting. He sings to attack, and only has two weapons in the game, the Medora Harp and the Loki Harp. He has the ability to scare monsters, actually lowering their level, and also a cheer command, which basically buffs your party's physical attacks, and which can be stacked by using it over and over. Certain harps can inflict certain status effects on enemies, Overall, then, he's an interesting character, but sort of weird. Also very interesting is the Geomancer, who can cast environmental-based attacks. On just normal ground, he will use a quake attack. In a desert, he'll use a quicksand attack. In water, he'll do a water spout attack, and so on. The bad news is that sometimes his attacks will backfire and damage the party. It's a pretty weird job, actually. The Peter Pan looking dude is a ranger, also called a hunter, who uses ranged weapons, bows and arrows. The bad news is you have to keep buying him arrows. You use an arrow every time you attack. The good news is he'll eventually get a boomerang, and he can be placed in the back row with no negative effects in terms of the damage that he inflicts. Dragoons are cool for being able to jump and land on the enemy and do like a lot of damage, and they're basically a must-have for certain battles. We've already seen them, of course, being used in certain battles with bosses that do a lot of magic damage. Summoner and Evoker are similar. The Summoner is just an upgraded Evoker. You summon creatures such as Shiva, Ifrit, Zeus, and so on. Each has a different type of attack. However, once you have the Sage, the Summoner is obsolete, since Sages can also summon. And then there's the Scholar, of course. He fights by slapping people with books. No one ever uses him because he's too overpowered. It feels like cheating, simply because no enemy can withstand the Scholar's book slap. 
So that pretty much covers all the jobs we haven't really used so far. Let's go back to where we were. The, the previous sword I was using. And it also raises your stats. Third boss is the rather generic General, who can hit pretty hard, but luckily my stats are now good enough that I can wallop him. The item that he drops is the game's strongest sword, but my Magic Knight cannot equip it. He can only equip katanas. However, all that's going to change because we are about to unlock the final two jobs. This guy runs a little shop where you can purchase level 8 magic, such as Meteor, making its Final Fantasy debut here, and Arise, which resurrects the character with full health instead of just one hit point. A hidden switch leads to a hidden shop, which sells crystal armor, which we don't need to buy because we'll find it for free later. However, this is where you can buy shurikens, so buy as many as you can afford. Two bosses in this room, Scylla, who is actually a sea creature, but here is depicted as a six-headed dog thing with big boobs. Though there is actually some justification for this depiction because in some old statues she is shown as being part dog. Defeating her will unlock the final two jobs, Ninja and Sage, and the accepted opinion is that you should immediately switch to two Ninjas and two Sages. They are practically universal fighters and magic users respectively. Ninjas can equip any weapons or armor, and Sages can cast any magic spell or summon, and they both have improved stats compared to all the other physical damage jobs or magic jobs. Alright, so now we're going to approach the fifth and last boss of this level, the Guardian. We've got two ninjas in the party, and you know what that means. Time to flip out and kill people. This dude will give you Ragnarok, the most powerful sword in the game, and which in most later Final Fantasy games is, is typically one of the very best swords. Now, at this point you need to march back through all seven levels of Eureka in order to get back to the Silk's Tower. Oh yeah, one thing, your warp spell does not work here, so you'll have to travel by foot. Silk's Tower provides you with lots of handy Phoenix Downs and Elixirs, as well as a set of Crystal Armor for your second ninja. And, uh, these guys are called what? That's three times. Three times this episode where I've had to make references to the male discharge. Oh yes, one other thing I forgot to mention. Get this, there's no place to save your game in this entire Mega Dungeon complex. You need to literally walk all the way back to the beginning of the dungeon and exit into the overworld and then save. Then retrace all your steps back to where you left off. The sheer sadism of this makes me strongly recommend using save states on an emulator. Okay, so we are finally getting closer to the end of this multi-dungeon dungeon. You are trapped by these dragons, but thanks to the power of friendship, we can escape. 
the ghost of Une and Doga will reach out to the various friends you've made throughout the game and call them to your aid, such as Sid, and Desh. Turns out he survived jumping into the furnace. Oh yeah, and like this little geek is going to be much use at all. Oh yeah, and even one of these idiots joins in. Now you can escape, and you finally run into Zandi. Haste is almost always a really good idea in boss fights, since it allows you to hit the enemy more times while attacking. This guy's going to cast Meteor at you, but hopefully you can take him down before he overwhelms your defenses. Finally, the real boss, the Cloud of Darkness, which was summoned by Zandi and apparently is going to destroy the universe or something. Now it's impossible to win this battle, and it appears that all is lost, but Doga and Une transfer their souls to you and then vanish for good. Now on to the final, final, final dungeon, the Dark World. And be aware that by this point, I mean, you can't leave the final dungeon or save your game. So if you die, you're going to resurrect outside the tower, and we'll need to go back up through the Silk's Tower again and refight any previous boss battles. So when I say this dungeon is sadistic, I'm not kidding. Alright, a mere five boss battles left, not counting the sort of mini bosses that appear when you open chests containing the ribbons. These guys are just weaker versions of Zandi. Dark World has a hub style layout, so you can take on the bosses in any order you want. Here's Echidna, a pretty ugly boss. Real life echidnas are just anteater like creatures. You are probably familiar with a certain video game echidna, and one thing about echidnas is they have very weird penises. However, this echidna is half woman, half snake, a creature from Greek mythology. Scylla, who you killed earlier, is her daughter, and her son, Cerberus, is another boss in this dungeon. Oh, and by the way, Final Fantasy fans might be familiar with her other son, Orthos. Echidna got in a good one here, petrifying one of my sages. So every time you defeat one of these four bosses, a little dark warrior appears. 
These are like your evil equivalents from the dark side. Even the dark warriors are kind of sick of Dark Cloud's shit and agree to help you. Hey, here's Cerberus. Meteor doesn't seem to have much effect on him, but physical attacks boosted by haste do work wonders on him. And he just blasts you non-stop with lightning attacks. Next up, Eremon making his debut performance in the series. He would go on to appear in just about every single Final Fantasy game. He alternates between different types of magic attacks. Sometimes he'll hit you with an elemental attack, which is good since you have resistance to those, or he might use Meteor, which is bad because it hits much harder. The battle for this guy is kind of similar to the final boss in that you will just have your ninjas pound him constantly while using the sages to constantly heal the whole party. And finally, the two-headed dragon. I guess they ran out of clever names at this point. And wow, 28 hits? This guy will try to... This guy will try to stomp your party members one at a time. Luckily, I'm leveled up enough so that his attacks don't actually kill me. You don't actually have to fight these guys to beat the game, but you'll want to because if you free the four Dark Knights, they will shave off around 20,000 hit points from Dark Cloud. For the most part, dungeons in Final Fantasy III are pretty straightforward compared to those in Dragon Quest with their confusing maze-like layouts and kind of weird gimmicks like the conveyor belts. The only dungeon that gets a little annoying in this game is the Dark World, which uses invisible passageways and dead ends and such. Once you reach the final boss, you must assemble the most powerful party possible to fight Dark Cloud. And your two ninjas and sages just won't cut it. So here we create the ultimate fighting force. Three bards for attacking and a scholar for magic support. Okay, well, no. You, you are clearly supposed to use ninjas and sages because they are simply the most powerful and flexible. There's really no benefit in using anything else. Though in the recent Final Fantasy III Pixel remake, they actually nerfed these guys considerably, so for that version they're not necessarily the best party. So Dark Cloud will just hit you over and over again with an attack called Particle Beam, slowly wearing down your health. Now right away you should equip the shurikens. You have to sort of manually equip them each time because when you throw them that one is used up and you can't use it a second time. You can hold one in each hand. But they are the most powerful weapon in the game. I had nine shurikens, so two turns using those plus one extra, and then I switched back to my most powerful swords and katanas, Mitch. But you know, it is kind of a shame that for a game that emphasizes flexibility and choice, it virtually forces you to use this specific party for this battle. But you know, what if there was another choice? What if there was an even more powerful party available, hiding right under our noses the whole time? Hmm. Onion Knights are utterly useless. They can only equip the most basic weapons. The strongest sword they can use is the Mithril Sword, with a puny 15 attack points and they can't use magic. Also, when they have low health, they fall down and cry like little babies. But there is a very well hidden secret in this game that will allow the Onion Knights to reach their full potential. In Silk's Tower on certain floors, there are these very rare dragon enemies. Apparently, the chance of encountering one is around 1 out of 128. Should you encounter one of these dragons, and I never have, 
it will most likely drop an elixir, but there is a chance that it will drop a piece of special equipment that can only be used by Onion Knights. The Onion equipment consists of the Onion Sword, Shield, Helmet, Armor, and Glove. It would require an enormous amount of time to get one full Onion set, and getting four is probably out of the question. However, there is a game bug that can be exploited, though some people believe this was put in deliberately for testing purposes, under the impression that no one would ever actually discover it. I'll now show you how to do this. So at any point in the game where you have an airship and enough money, you can go in and buy a bunch of potions. You'll need to have 99 potions in your inventory. That's the max number that you can carry. You will then fly to the floating continent and go all the way back to the altar cave, that very first cave that you started the game in. And you need to arrange your items in a very specific way. Bottom left slot must be empty. Three spaces above that is where you must put the 99 potions. And there must be an item in all the surrounding slots as well, except for that bottom left slot. In the bottom right slot is where you put the item that you want to turn into the onion equipment, leather armor in this case. Now you can have other items like up above these spaces, but just to make it look less complicated, I removed all the extraneous stuff just for this demonstration. Now as you might recall, enemies in the altar cave sometimes drop potions. The odds are about 1 in 4. If you're using save states, you just rearrange your inventory like I said, fight an enemy, and reload if it doesn't drop a potion. You can also do this without save states, but this means you have to rearrange the inventory after each battle. If an enemy does drop a potion, the fact that you now have 100 potions in your inventory causes some sort of overflow issue, which causes the item that you placed in the lower right corner to sort of upgrade itself to a different item. And this works for any item, but it just happens that the leather helmet, glove, and shield, and armor get upgraded to the onion equivalent of those pieces. So my four leather armors are now four onion armors. And so when this happens, you basically just do another save state, rearrange your inventory, put another leather item into the correct slot, and repeat. So getting all the onion armor is pretty simple, and can be done maybe in about, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. Unfortunately, swords are a bit more complicated since Ragnarok gets updated to the onion sword, and you probably don't have Ragnarok yet because that's the very final sword that you find in the game. I did, however, have four katanas, so I upgraded those through various levels, like to Break Blade, then Excalibur, then Ragnarok, and then Onion Sword. This is still a certain amount of work, but it's approximately 1,000 times quicker than trying to get them from the dragons. So now, basically, you just change jobs to Onion Knight, put on your new equipment, and holy moly, 200 for attack and 185 defense? Back when this guy was a magic knight with Genji armor, his defense was 56. So at this point you have now unlocked the fully equipped Onion Knight, the most powerful fighter in the game. And these guys are virtually unstoppable. I mean, just look at these stats. Evasion, 99%. Magic Defense 176, it's like nothing can hurt you. Also, the Onion Helmet acts as a ribbon, so you're immune to status ailments. But there's actually more. If you keep leveling them up once you get to about 85 or 86, their baseline stats for strength, agility, and so on increases by 7 points every time you gain a level. Now once this starts happening, boss fights become utterly trivial. I mean, there's technically a small chance that an attack will evade your defense, so you should have a few Phoenix Downs and potions just in case, or you can temporarily switch to Mage and drink an elixir and then revive or heal. But for the most part, you can just sort of stomp any enemy without any problems whatsoever. And as fascinating as the existence of the Onion Knight is, it's probably not going to be the way that most people actually want to play the game. Alright, so going back to our normal party here, we're just going to keep whittling down Dark Cloud's health. And there's really no reason to be a miser when it comes to XP. I had stockpiled enough elixirs that I didn't have to worry about running out of magic. Eventually, Dark Cloud will fall, and with that, you've finally beaten the game.
a relatively long epilogue follows. You play taxi driver and drop off all your little buddies back at their homes. Final Fantasy III was a substantial commercial and critical success for Square, eventually selling around a million and a half copies in Japan. By comparison, Dragon Quest IV sold a little bit over twice that, so the game was a big financial success, though not quite at Dragon Quest levels. Famitsu gave it a 36 out of 40, making it the sixth best score from Famitsu at that time. Years later, Famitsu readers voted it number 8 in Famitsu's Best Video Game of All Time poll, behind Final Fantasy X, VII, and IV, and also behind Dragon Quest III and VIII, making it and Dragon Quest III the only Famicom games in the top 10. As for me, I'd say it's clearly the best 8-bit Final Fantasy game, and definitely the most interesting RPG for the system. Its job system, while somewhat unusual, would be used again in future games such as Final Fantasy V and XII. But to me, this feels almost kind of like a turning point in the history of the Famicom, like the end of an era. Square made this huge, sprawling game and then basically moved on to the Super Famicom. And honestly, I can't think of any other especially notable Famicom JRPG released after this. Japanese developers would continue to produce Famicom games, of course, but all the big players were transitioning to 16-bits. 1991 will be the first year that produced fewer Famicom games than the year prior. We are now at exactly 60 episodes, so I'm going to officially divide the series right here. The first 60 episodes chronicle the rise of the Famicom. The remaining 70 or so will chronicle the system's decline and fall. We'll encounter lots of weird, fascinating games, and a decent number of great games, but we are basically entering the Byzantine Empire period of the Famicom, the system's long, slow sunset. For the moment, though, we will bid April 1990 adieu and begin May of 1990. Alright, here's an oddity. Kagaru Densetsu, published by Pixel. This game is sort of mysterious, as we'll discuss. It was developed by ITL, a company that we've encountered before. Kagaru Densetsu means Shadow Wolf Legend. This is sort of an action RPG thing, but a very, very basic one. First of all, you'll need to name the three characters. The story is something about a demon who has brainwashed ninjas and killed the protagonist's father, and now you and your buddies need to go out and defeat the bad guys or something. You can tell this game was pretty low budget, as there's no sort of like opening cutscenes or anything. You just wander out into the hideously ugly world, whose terrain is made up of flat ground, hills, trees, and mountains. You cannot walk over the mountains. 
And the road that you see here is just sort of give you some general guidance as to where to go. You will constantly be forced into random battles where these incredibly fast dudes run back and forth and attack you. They're, they're actually very annoying. Every so often you get to encounter a building like this one. Entering it will refill your magic, I believe, and sometimes give you a new magic spell. So, a couple things about this game. As mentioned, the publisher on this is a company called Pixel, or Pixel Corporation, as the title screen says. Now we are familiar with a company called Pixel that did a lot of development work for other companies, including LJN's X-Men game for the NES. The odd thing is that the Pixel we are familiar with did a lot of uncredited work on NES games, but didn't publish any NES games. And yet, here we have a game published by Pixel, but developed by an outside company, which seems a little weird. And this is the only console game published by this Pixel. Well, it does turn out that in the mid-80s, Pixel did publish some MSX games, right around the same time they were doing work on various NES games. But the logo that we see on these Pixel MSX games is very different from that found on Kagaru Densetsu's title screen or the back of the box art. So I was thinking, are these actually the same company? I mean, Pixel isn't exactly a super creative name for a video game company. Eventually, though, I did find some good quality photos of the back of the MSX game Thunderbot, and I was able to read the address. And it is, in fact, the same address on the back of Kagaru Densetsu, so I guess it actually is the same company. But this just leads to the question, why? Why did Pixel get back into publishing for only one single game? And of all things, why was it this game? And to make matters more weird, this may have originally been planned to be published by Taito. Graphics showing Taito's name have been found in the ROM, which makes one wonder if this was originally planned as a sequel to Taito's 1985 game Legend of Kage. The combat in these two games feels very similar, in that ninjas just come running at you very fast non-stop and that you are armed with a sword and some throwing stars. The lack of jumping all the way up through the trees is the major thing missing from Kagaru Densetsu. An official sequel to Legend of Kage was released for the DS by Taito in 2008. Oh, and one other fun fact about this game. This ad for the game was published in Japanese gaming magazines, and the art was lifted directly from Dragon Ball. Now there's magic in this game, but it sucks. In order to use it, you need to press A and B together, and then use the D-pad to select what spell you want to use, and you actually sit down on the ground while doing this, making you completely vulnerable to enemy attacks while you're casting magic. Everything about the presentation in this game makes me wonder if this was developed in the 80s and then sat around for a few years and somehow ended up in Pixel's possession. It doesn't really feel like a 1990 Famicom game. I'll just run down a few other odd things. Connecting the second controller seems to unlock cheats, presumably for testing purposes. Holding down B on the second controller will disable all enemy encounters on the overworld. And using these cheats, you can also revive yourself after dying or uh, allowing your character to walk over water and mountains. And in terms of actually beating the game, you can reach the final boss pretty quickly. A tool-assisted speedrun beat it in four and a half minutes, possibly by using RNG manipulation in order to avoid random encounters, and essentially also just walking the shortest path to the final boss. In comparison, a TAS speedrun of Zelda 2 takes around 40 minutes. Same with TAS speedruns of Chrysalis. So there's really not much game here compared to other action RPGs. There's no NPCs, shops, towns, dungeons. It's just walking through this maze-like overworld, fighting random battles for experience, and killing a grand total of four bosses. Not that you will care, because there is absolutely no reason whatsoever for you to play this game.
One last game here, Neketsu Koku Dodgeball Boo Soccer Hin from Technos. And you might be wondering, is this a soccer game or a dodgeball game? Maybe it's both. Well, actually, no, it's just soccer. The boys have decided to take a break from dodgeball. Now, there is actually a story here. There's a big soccer game coming up, but unfortunately, the soccer team ate some sushi and came down with a bad case of salmonella. So, the dodgeball team decided to fill in for them. Can the gang of lovable misfits defeat the other school's soccer team? Well, yes, using the power of physical violence. Oh, and by the way, here's a little tidbit that I picked up from Japanese Wikipedia's summary of the game. And of course, this thing got released in the US and Europe as Nintendo World Cup, with a slammin' new musical intro. So instead of having high school kids playing soccer, we now have 12 international teams. And the teams are actually different in a way which I will discuss a bit later. Now, as far as soccer games go, this is pretty decent. You have some control over the AI here, so I'm changing how often my team shoots and a couple other things. It's probably best to not have the goalkeeper join in. Since this is a Kunio-kun game, you can get rough on the field. Just go ahead and knock the crap out of the opposing team. There will just be bodies lying out on the field in this game. Now I'll admit, I've never been a big fan of soccer games for the NES, but Nintendo World Cup is pretty playable. It's fast-paced, it's not too complicated, it's kind of like Super Dodgeball. Now there is one other interesting thing here. You have special moves that you can pull off by hitting the A and B buttons together. But apparently this special move will only be performed if you've actually traveled a certain number of steps since the last time you stopped. So when you get the ball you have to move say 12 steps then hit A and B on the 12th step. I think. I had a hard time pulling these things off. But if you do so successfully, you will use a special powerful kick or something. Each team has its own special. The game was pretty successful and got ported to the Genesis, the Game Boy, and the PC Engine. This is probably not most people's favorite Kunio game, but you could absolutely do worse when it comes to soccer games. Well, I was originally planning to do a Cron Turbo episode next, but have decided to postpone it since after Final Fantasy III, I just cannot handle tackling E's books 1 and 2 right now. But it will be happening soon. Best game this episode? Yeah, it's Final Fantasy III. Perhaps the best JRPG on the system. Worst game? I'll say Dino Wars. I hate to use terms like lazy developers, I don't know why the game turned out the way it did, but upon release this thing probably cost around $70 in today's money. Considering the game just repeats the same level over and over again, it's kind of hard to not consider this to be a bit of a ripoff. Next episode will be a little more chill, with another Disney Capcom game and a nice little shooter with a rather unfortunate name in the Japanese version, and also... Ah, damn it. In addition to this, the long overdue Herschel Gordon Lewis video will finally be released. So, see you all soon.